So we begin. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this session of Samyukta Poetry that we call In the Spotlight. There's a bit of echo. So uh, in this particular session that we call uh, In the Spotlight, today we are featuring Run for the Shadows by Sridhar Swami. More on the book, but uh, before that, let me just provide a bit of context. Uh, context, interestingly, is a very loaded word at this point of time. I'm sure Sridhar would agree. So uh, I was, uh, you know, talking to a fellow poet, Sony Somarajan, uh, just yesterday, and I was telling him about this work, Run for the Shadows, and uh, I was telling him that the mental image that this book brought up, as far as I was concerned, was that of a river flowing on while gazing at its banks. It misses nothing, but it doesn't stop. And he asked me, do, do you mean that it is spiritual? And I said, uh, no, it's not spiritual per se. It's a genre of poetry that I would call visual, watchful, observant. And, uh, you know, the, the more I read uh, Run for the Shadows, I've been to my second reading by now of this book. The more I read, uh, I, I feel that, you know, the, the idea that comes to my mind is uh, the sound of the clicking of a metronome, you know, the ways that the instrument moves orderly, clicked with an air of definitiveness. And interestingly, I was telling Sridhala yesterday that, you know, for me, I, I associate people uh, with, with certain qualities. And that's very valuable, uh, you know, when you're also looking at poets. And you know there are poets of history, there are poets uh, who deal with grandeur, there are poets that deal with conversations, but desire and so on. And for me, Sridhana is a poet of the mind. And this book, you know, this remarkable book, and uh, that's something that people often, you know, say it as a you know manner, so to speak. This is remarkable. That is remarkable. I think that you know a lot of books are very remarkable but each of them vary in the, in the way that they are remarkable, to borrow a little bit from one of our classic writers. And this book is like the mind, you know, uh, the, the various layers of the mind, the injuries of the mind, the ways that the mind has been broken and put together again and so on. And I think we will discover more about this book as we go on, uh, but, uh, you know, before uh, going any further, I think that I should, by way of introduction, uh, mention a little bit about Sridhala. Uh, Sridhala Swami, uh, that's her full name. Uh, her first collection uh, was called A Reluctant Survivor, so, which was uh, published by the Sahitya Academy. And, uh, uh, you know, it uh, was shortlisted for the Shakti Bhatt First Book Award. And, uh, you know, uh, her second book of poems was called Escape Artist. And this Run for the Shadows is her third book. And she also writes for children. Her, her, her publications have been with Pratham books and uh, you know, they've been translated into a number of different languages. And she's uh, quite the decorated writer. She was the uh, 2011 Charles Wallace writer in residence at the University of Sterling. And uh, she has uh, been a fellow of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. And, uh, you know, She's also done quite a significant amount of editing. So she's also an editor by training. Uh, what kind of editor? She will tell us more about it, not the editor that we have in mind. So uh, I, I suppose there is a, a composite, uh, let's say, uh, skill set that Sridhala brings uh, to her writing and the way that she has gone about uh, you know, penning her poems. So that's enough from my side. We would like to hear from you, Sridhala. Uh, what you know? Tell us something about uh, either your first ever published poem or escape artist. The choice is yours. Uh, I'll tell you about escape artist. I don't remember my first published <laughs> poem. Um, escape artist. Um, you know, I I don't think of collections as collections that I'm working towards in terms of. Um, 
uh, an overall coherent uh, book. I just gather poems I've written from the last time I published. Uh, so the uh, escape artists like this one and the one before that are pretty much the poems that I wrote between Reluctant Survivor and Run for the Shadows. Uh, but the interesting thing about it was that, uh, you know, while I was, I, I wrote most of it when I was at Sterling. And uh, Sterling was a very, um, it was a beautiful place, uh, but it was also a place where I was completely alone for the, probably the first time in more than the decade and a half preceding that time. Uh, because, you know, I'd, uh, I'd had a son, I'd come back home, there were always people around me. So for the first time at Sterling, I had two and a half, three months that was completely mine. And there were no other people apart from the people in the department. So I had, um, it was both frightening in terms of how much time I had uh, to do whatever I wanted with, but also I had the freedom to read, to experiment with my writing and uh, to write a lot and to fail at it a lot of the time. Uh, but so that is how most of the writing that uh, is an escape artist happened during that time. Uh, and it's a matter of um, luck most of the time actually that uh, at the time that my uh, collection was ready as a manuscript and I was ready to show it around, uh, it just happened that the Jahangir Sabawala Foundation had been established and uh, because Jahangir Sabawala as a painter uh, was himself extremely interested in um, the literary arts and in poetry in particular, um, the foundation wanted to support one lecture on art and one uh, manuscript of poetry. Uh, Anupama's manuscript is also uh, one that uh, uh, was published under the aegis of the Jahangir Sabawala Foundation. Uh, so uh, it just happened that I had this manuscript ready to go and the Jahangir Sabawala Foundation accepted it and it came into being. And uh, what kind of, uh, you know, poems did escape artist feature? Uh, maybe we could have a sample from that and you could talk us through the process. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, do, uh, okay. Uh, I've, I've, um, so this poem that I'll be reading from escape artist is called Not Loss But Residue. And it's one of the poems that, um, you know, the, there are some poems that come to you whole and you, you're, you write it out as uh, when you begin more or less. And then after that, you just uh, work with what you already have a little bit. But uh, Not Lost But Residue is a poem that existed in small snippets across different poems. And uh, in a sense, I kind of cannibalized all of those portions from different poems and put them together in this when it finally made sense to me. Uh, so it's a poem in several parts. It's called Not Loss, But Residue. He writes me letters at the back of the bus, a sacred text on a grain of rice, things he does not say to me over the phone. Old fashioned, I call him, and laugh at the things he says. When he speaks, he stammers. Ink stains the page. What I have is a sword he has given me willingly. Just for once, I want all the power to keep you waiting on my words, measure my satisfaction in your loss, just for once. I am sitting at the window reading. My eyes slide down the page and everything changes. You reach your hand past my breast and grab my heart. Squeeze. It smells of rust and weeds at low tide. Your hand a slow mo pulse. I discover there are no such things as heart strings. When you tell me you dream of falling, I find ways to remove everything that could break your fall. It is not your fall I want to break. Just for once, I want to talk to you and give nothing away. He dreams my hands are cut off at the wrist and wakes up crying. I flex my fingers, make a fist, take his hand and hold them as a lover might. His wrists have lines that might be scars. I place my hand against his palm to palm as children and dancers do. The measure of love 
is not loss, but residue, vasana. Leave if you must, but leave me a groove in the mind down which memory can run like a cultivated habit. Thank you very much for that, Sridhala. I, uh, as I mentioned before, I love the, the remarkable, you know, expanse of your, your language. Uh, that is one thing that I would like to comment on at, at this point of time. Um, you know, the way that you weave different, uh, let's say, semantics, the different languages. Um, yeah, how does that process come about? Like uh, in Run for the Shadows, you have, uh, you know, references like Kanna and, uh, you know, references to the various Carnatic tunes. Here you have used Vasana. A no number of times I, I have observed that. So, yeah, your linguistic, uh, you know, felicity with that? We are a multilingual people. I mean, we exist in several languages in the course of our day. It would be odd if our poetry didn't occasionally contain or express uh, that uh, person that we are uh, writing. Um, I, uh, I mean, there's something to be said for not doing it in order to uh, kind of uh, tick some check boxes. Uh, but on the other hand, if it, uh, it, if it feels organic to what the poem is doing or is saying, then, then you shouldn't have to look for an alternate word when this one is the right one, just because it's in another language. Mm. Um, I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, some of the other poets who are here uh, to just uh, talk about, uh, you know, what uh, Sridhala just mentioned about multilingual, uh, you know, uh, let's say expressions coming into poetry and how they feel about it. Anybody would like to? Because uh, a number of us I know do write, uh, you know, this kind of interweaving poetry. Unmute. Yeah, I mean, unmute. Sorry, I'm sorry. I was, um, I was saying that certainly in Sridhala's work, it does not feel like it's being done for any fashion. It's absolutely natural. Yes, exactly. You know, it, it just, it, it's like, uh, it just flows with it. And there's a, there's a sense of, uh, let's say, a great uh, natural feel that comes about. Uh, it, it's not there for effect. That's but not, not too often either. Yeah, not too often either. Right. So um, shall we now talk about Run for the Shadows? <clears throat> shall we do that? Sure. Yes. So uh, first, uh, the thing that came to my mind when I saw this title was, is it a warning? Or is it advice? Asking me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Warning or advice? <laughs> you can take it as either. Um, I mean, it actually just has a very mundane uh, origin, which I don't know whether I should share because there are literally only two people so far who have uh, figured out where the title comes from. Uh, it comes from a Bowie song. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that what, that's what it is. It comes from a David Bowie song. It's a, it's a line from there. Uh, but it seemed, uh, it, it seemed apt uh, for, uh, it, it, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of a big basket in which a lot of these poems can easily sit, you know, I mean, this, this title. Um, it also occurs in one of the poems, you know, in a, a kind of a, glancing way. Uh, it's not that important to that poem, but it, it occurs in it. Um, so when I was looking for a title, uh, in, in various iterations of this manuscript, there were different titles and naturally the poems themselves were different and trying to fit, but somehow nothing seemed to fit. And there were at least three manuscripts I abandoned that had different titles just because the title didn't work somehow. But when, when I picked this one, it just, from start to finish, it just seemed to work. I see. And uh, about the making of this book, we would like to really know about that because uh, I'm informed that there were like seven years over which this book had been written. So, yeah. You know, uh, th that's the thing to say because you have to say something about the book. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you're very you know, 
and it's a complete thing. You know, unless you're saying that this book is a project that is about this or that particular subject and all the poems in it are, are around or circle around that subject, it's pretty much a collection of everything I've written since the last book I wrote. And that that's taken seven years, right? Escape Artist was published seven years ago. So this is, it's taken seven years to write. So that's that's how it's seven years. It's not uh, that I toiled over it or anything. I'm just a very lazy or a slow writer. I'm not lazy, I'm slow. Uh, so it takes time for poems to compost into the shape I want them to be in and to become what they become in any book. And so that took seven years. I mean, there are some poems in this that are from 11 years ago. Yeah, something like that. I think Mani is going to read that poem. I see. Uh, so, uh, you know, what made you keep them for 11 years and then, you know, bring them back and place them here? Did they feel like a natural fit here? Or, yes, uh... yes. I mean, uh, that, that, that poem was ready 11 years ago. It could have gone into Escape Artist, but I felt it didn't have a place there. It didn't sit well in that collection. Whereas, uh, you know, when I... Uh, when I was putting this manuscript together, I, uh, the, the, I just knew that this was, this was the poem that needs to begin this collection. So, uh, so once I got the title of the book, and once I knew this was the first uh, poem of the book, somehow other things just started falling into place. And uh, everything, uh, it's like, uh, it's like finding your wordle word, I suppose. You know, once once certain things find their right slot, the other things fall into place very easily. I see. So, uh, shall we uh, inaugurate the book with a reading of uh, "Dear Stranger" by Mani Rao? Uh, for those here and those who are listening, Mani Rao is a respected poet, translator, and an independent <laughs> scholar. <laughs> you know where that is coming from, but uh, yes. And always a pleasure to read or to listen to. So may I invite you? Are you sure I should read before Sridhala reads? Yes, yes. I've already yes. read a poem. Please read. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. All right. Since it's the opening poem, right? Yes, it is the opening poem. Dear stranger deciphering this ancient script. Dear stranger. Dear sentient being from a future so far, I cannot imagine anything about it. Not the shape of poems, not the way you will handle the corners of pages, not the science you will use to decipher this ancient script in which I write, but which to me is given and taken for granted. Dear stranger who makes my work timeless and immortal, for whose eyes only I seal this message in the bottle of centuries. Dear salvager, dear rescue artist, dear hauntologist, what have you done? I wrote to escape attention. There was a brief sentence I had to serve before remembrance could, not, could be not about what has been. There was a brief sentence I had to serve before remembrance could be not about what has been. I wanted to fall like dust and be renewed in leaves. How much have you forgotten? I would like these words to be like a child's first drawings. If you must, keep them as you would a stone you pick to remember a place you visited. Dear stranger, I say these things because I know they will mean nothing to you. Thank you, Mani. That was lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, if I may ask you, Mani, why did you pick this poem? <laughs> you know, when I read it, I had this thought of like this sort of space, spacey sound effects behind it. It was almost like something in limbo. And Sridhala was like this cosmonaut inside this sort of space shuttle going somewhere detached and sort of all the, all the concrete stuff was cut away and sort of abstracted and sort of distilled and sort of some message being put out in time and space. 
and therefore made free of it. And I just loved it for that, you know? And of course, for me, it signified a lot more than just this one book. It, it uh, sort of, you know, it had that whole rescue artist, escape artist, you know, and even reluctant survivor, hauntologist. These are all about something that is haunting, that, uh, that is following. Um, we don't actually know exactly what has happened. What is the disaster that has happened? Of course, I think that, you know, the earth has gone and there is just this person in, in space completely bewildered and, and at the same time fully intelligent and making all these comments to some sentient being out there. <laughs> I don't know if I expressed anything um, sensible, but that's kind of, I just rattled off, yeah. No, that's the uh, exact impression I got too, you know, uh, that uh, those words that are out there, it, it's like they're just being boomed out into space. Now, I don't know if that's what Sridhala intended, but this is what we are reading, you know, uh, it's like a, a post-apocalyptic world uh, sort of a, a scenario. So, uh, Sridhala, yeah. uh, coming back to you, uh, would you like to comment on this and then, you know, read us one of uh, your selections? I don't want to comment on it. I'm just very interested to know. That this is <laughs> are, are, you, are you secretly laughing? You know? No, absolutely <laughs> not. I think, uh, you know, I think there's um, uh, there's always um, there's always uh, something of what other people see uh, or take away from what you have said that overlaps with what you wanted to say. And then there are new things that come from, uh, you know, people's own imaginations and their own, uh, the, the way that they look at the world or what they envision. And uh, it's the same, but it's not. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Uh, because, you know, uh, there, there's something that, that has communicated itself uh, in the way that you had wanted or you wanted to say. And then other things have added resonance to what you have put out in the world. And that's beautiful. I think that's fantastic. Um, you know, Sridhala, that scene in Solaris, yes. uh, Tarkovsky's, where, you know, there's this like the looking down at the ocean and the earth. I sort of get that kind of position in this poem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, uh, yeah, I mean, Tarkovsky is one of the uh, poets of cinema who, uh, who, whose work has influenced my writing, if, if you will, yeah. I mean, uh, more than poets uh, of language, it's the poets of cinema whose uh, work has had a lot to do with the way I write poetry. So yes, very well. I mean, it, that, so this is what I mean. That wasn't uh, my conscious uh, viewpoint when I was writing this poem, but I can see how that makes sense. You know, I can see how that makes sense. Uh, should I read yes. a poem from Run for the Shadi? No, I would like to, please. Okay. Can I uh, do one thing first, though? Um, I want to read a poem from my first collection, and then I want to read this poem that I'm going to. Okay. Oh, um, so uh, this one is called About a Tree. <clears throat> Just where the road curves around the corner stands a tree. Trucks come bearing sand and cement, and drivers just miss backing into it on their way into the house that's coming up there. In spring, the tree squats in sand piles. The trunk rises dark and strong and its branches bear lightly the slanting translucence of new leaves. The tree gives up its leaves to the air and the light, even as we toss at its roots our casual gifts of brick and stone. So um, the next, the poem that I'm going to read from Run for the Shadows is called Scene. Mm -hmm. A forest is in thought. Branches are unresolved. Birds are leaves in motion. Inattention, careful. And then a forest is a stereogram, birds, in Dolby surround, 
movement like the sky, invisible. In repetition, there is no pattern. A forest is clarity without the attention. Birds, branches, sky, intent. That was uh, succinct and it for me embodies everything that I have been, uh, you know, commenting about uh, your poetry in terms of uh, the, the control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Kartika, um, can I request you to please mute? Or would you like to add to the discussion? Yeah, thank you. Yes, so uh, as I was saying, um, <clears throat> this book embodies for me, I mean, this poem embodies for me uh, everything that you know I have felt about your poetry. The, the sense of uh, control, the sense of, uh, let's say, a uh, rather sentient presence that, that pervades the entire ecosystem of this book. And uh, don't let me know, is, is the cover page uh, anything to do with this particular poem or is it from somewhere no, else? No, no. Uh, you know, the cover was just a gorgeous um, set of uh, discussions that happened between the designer and Kartika, uh, VK and myself. I mean, she said, is there anything you particularly want for the cover? And I just wrote out a brief description of the elements that I wanted on the cover. I said, I want yellow and I want a tree. And uh, that's pretty much it. And I said, uh, I, I said, I want very little text on the uh, cover and I would if possible want the tree running over the back and the front cover that was pretty much all the things that I said and uh, Saurabh uh, the designer came up with uh, this I mean the artist is someone else but Saurabh is the designer and uh, you know like I was saying about uh, uh, Dear Stranger it's everything that I said and nothing like what I had imagined in my own head so uh, it was perfect, you know, I just loved it. I love the process of going back and forth through it. It has nothing to do with uh, uh, any of any particular poem in this book. It's just that trees play a large role in my poetry through the years. So I thought it should have a tree. Okay. And now I would like to just uh, ask your uh, views on the structure of this book. There are poems of different lengths of, of you know, different uh, poetic elements. There are poems with long lines, short lines, those that almost read like prose poems, but are not quite there. So, uh, you know, what were the elementals that, that shaped this book? You know, I'm just gonna switch out of my screen. I don't wanna screen share or anything, but just entirely by chance today, hmm. uh, somebody had posted um, uh, something that Ann Carson said in an interview a long time ago. And uh, I, I think somebody pretty much asked her what form does in her poetry. And this is what she says. That's because it arises out of the thing itself. There aren't forms that are from somewhere. They're just in there. You have to mess around until you find your form at the beginning. And once you find it, you just follow it, uh, which makes sense to me. I don't, I don't set out by saying I'm going to write a sonnet or I'm going to write in this form or that form. I start writing and I see what the poem is doing and I just go where it takes me. Some of them uh, need to be prose poems like uh, AI Winter. Some of them need to be short poems with uh, brief lines like scene was. And some of them are not prose poems, but they have very long lines. And if there is anything that I was doing consciously in terms of form, it was just uh, in this collection, I did not want to be restricted by the size of the book or the page as far as my line length was concerned. I wanted the line to be as long as it needed to be. And in this context, I remembered something that Arun Kolatkar um, once asked a publisher. Um, uh, they, somebody wanted to publish his book and then he said, uh, will you let my lines be as long as they are? Like, will you choose a book size that will accommodate the line. And the publisher said, I don't think that will be possible to do because it will be too expensive to produce the book that way. He said, then I don't want to publish with you. And uh, I mean, props to Context and Kartika who uh, accommodated the size of my lines, the length of my lines in uh, the book that they created. They, there was some back and forth 
uh, regarding design for this, but they did it. They they let me have my line length without breaking it over two lines. And you know that that happens. You know when when it's a smaller size book, people will let the second the line run into a second one, and then continue. And it just looks wrong. As a poem, it just looks wrong. Now um, I would like to you know before you read your uh, next poem, I would like to just ask you about uh, the about love that uh, you know seems to be pervading the pages of this book in its in its various manifestations you know particularly uh, let's say parental love and also this very intriguing poem that uh, is called vertical smile of course that's not about parental love but you know uh, the the very many manifestations in all its shades and vigor and rigor so um, just let us know about that, please. Mm. I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> if I have a love poem that's there, I will write it. I don't know what to say about it. Uh, okay. uh, about uh, Vertical Smile, which is a poem I do want to read. Uh, since we were just talking about form, it is uh, a poem that, uh, you know, Don Patterson, uh, while anthologizing a book of sonnets, once said, uh, a sonnet is basically a square poem. It's, you know, that's the, whatever other, uh, you know, prosodic elements belong to it, it's ultimately a square poem. That's what it is. So that was the thing that I had in my mind when um, I was shaping this poem in a sense. And on the page, it is a square poem. It is literally just a square poem uh, designed to fit into a square. Um, but also, you know, um, about love, I have nothing to say. I mean, whatever I have to say, it's in the poem. So I can read it if you like. Yes, please. We would love to listen to that. Okay. Vertical smile. I'm smiling at you. A vertical smile. Dark. Like nothing you've ever seen. Smile back, please. Sing into my mouth. Draw out my breath as you would a ribbon sliding it between your fingers. Tie me to you, tie you to me. Now breathe, stay this way. Hold the smile between your lips until it is no longer a gesture, but a memory lodged in muscle and blood. Recall in later years, these hours, when more than blood called, when what gave answer was something we could not name. Then forget all this, because this is a vertiginous fall. Step back from the brink now. You know, your uh, poetry comes from a place of both vulnerability and strength. Uh, Look at the you know the the power of the words on on this page and uh, the the way that you know uh, the the whole precarity is is being expressed. Uh, I'm, I'm you know absolutely <coughs> taken up by the beauty of this. And uh, from here, I would like you to read. Um, yes. Rituals of departure, if you may. <laughs> okay, that's going to give everyone whiplash a little bit, but oh. there we are. Uh, so I just want to assure everyone that I'm well, okay? Because uh, the first few people who read this book um, either called me or wrote back to me and said, are you okay? Are you going to die? What's the matter with you? I'm well, I promise. Uh, it takes, uh, this poem takes a line uh, of Ed, the poet Ed El Adnan's uh, poem, uh, which goes, the first desire will accompany you to the last breath. Rituals of departure. For years, I thought of nothing but my father's death and the manner of its arrival. The prognosis so sudden and dramatic, the lingering decade when we treated the disease like an honored guest that we wouldn't allow to leave, coddling it, and later accompanying it as it made to depart, dreading the lives that would be uprooted by the force of its final departure, 
As it was said, the trees uprooted themselves to follow Hanuman as he took off for Lanka, not wanting to be parted from him, but falling back to earth after all as they must and having to live with the consequences of the violence and its aftermath. We were ravaged, but we recovered. Years later, when my own body began to alert me to its impermanence, I ignored it. Other people needed my attention more and I gave it. My body, insistent, showed me where it would give. Was I surprised that in this matter, it followed my father? The path was already familiar. Death would come, but could it not be invited in, the customs and forms of its welcome already in place and no surprises along the way? It may not have been what I had desired, but in this particular avatar, it was a companion I was familiar with. I could be a courteous host to this old guest, leave when it does, quietly and in silence, just as my father did. This, uh, this poem really gripped me, you know, and uh, uh, could we say that, you know, this is a, a progression in the thoughts that have come from your earlier work, hospital catalogs? Yeah, this is one of my mother's bugbears, you know. I mean, she kind of uh, wishes that I would stop talking about illness and <laughs> death and all of these subjects that make her uncomfortable. Uh, but, you know, I think it's natural um, at the stage that one is in life to um, be aware of uh, one's mortality, the mortality of one's loved ones uh, as they age, as uh, they battle or live with illnesses of various kinds. And uh, certainly when it's uh, a close family member whose death uh, has happened and it's the first one that you have experienced in your life, it's bound to have a particular, uh, particularly deep impact. And uh, yeah, I mean, I worked through a lot of uh, what I was thinking and feeling through the years uh, during and since uh, through my poetry. And naturally, as, um, as one's experiences change and as one gets older or time has passed, the nature of one's writing regarding any given subject changes. And so the change between hospital catalogs in the first book, hospital catalogs, CODA in the second one, and this one in this one, in this book, have naturally kind of moved in their own ways. You know, one of our uh, participants, Rukmini Prabhakar, uh, who will also be reading, uh, you know, she was uh, talking to me about how remarkable she found this poem. All right. So I, I just want to get her thoughts on that. And anybody else who would like to join in, you know, this is not uh, just two people conversing. All of us are there. So Rukmini, uh, I believe you wanted to read this poem. I'm sorry, but so did I. So, so I gave myself... Uh, uh, first preference in this. I did, you know, I read it 20 times today because I thought I was reading it. And also because this poet had, uh, this poet, poem had really deeply impacted me. So um, you've read it. Uh, but so thank I'm, you for wanting to. Do you know, I want to tell you something, Sridhla. So 30 years ago, my 76 year old father, quietly and in silence, he walked up to the fifth floor of our apartment and he jumped to his death. And I was visiting, visiting my parents at the time and I was in bed with fever on the day and my kids were just three and uh, one year old at that point. My father was suffering from depression for almost 15 years. And when his medication was changed, he silently went back into depression and none of us even realized it, you know, he was so silent. We were ravaged over time and some of us actually thought that we had recovered. But as you said, you know, the path had become familiar. So two years later, my 30-year-old nephew le leapt from the 20th floor of a building he was working in. And he was not even suffering from any known mental illness at the time. So, you know, when I read Rituals of Departure, I thought to myself, this is a narrative I could have written myself. And not just Rituals of Departure, in fact, reading run for the shadow, I found myself joining dots parallelly with my own life at so many different levels. 
uh, the thing about peace, the one on meditation, these are all topics that are so close to my heart. You know, you're also a book that I would read and reread many times. Because for one, you play with poetic paradoxes that it, I would each time, I would have to shift my internal space to just plug into your multiverse of altered realities. And Sridhla, in complete acknowledgement to the wonder of your craftsmanship, you have many, many, many realities within each of the poems and narratives that you've written. Thank you, Rukmini. And I'm really sorry for all your losses. And uh, I don't know what poetry does when it is received by someone who has had these experiences, but whatever it is that has made this poem resonate with you, I hope it gives you comfort above. I don't know whether comfort is even the right word, but whatever no, it gives no, you. I, I just felt that this is something I could have written. Yes. And I hope uh, you find your own way to write whatever you need to out of. So many times over the years, in so many forms, yes. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that also. Thank you, Rukmani. Would you please read uh, your selection? So after, after the tussle that uh, Sonia and I had, it's my poem. No, it's Sridhar's poem. I said, no, it's my poem. She said, no, it's Sridhar's poems. We went back and forth a bit, and finally she said, no, it's Sridhar's poems. I said, okay, let her have it then. <laughs> Thank you. So, so I said that it the was other because poem. you know I have been wanting to read this poem, but uh, I have been trying to find an occasion to read it that seems right. Uh, and sometimes it's just the selection of poems that get read on that particular day that make it the right poem to read. Uh, and today it felt like the right day to read it, uh, not least because my mother is not watching this live. So <laughs> that's that's one part of the reason, but also because I think the selection of poems that everyone else has chosen they seem to fit well into that. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, all of these, these are this, all of the readings so far have been online for me. So it's a kind of a very limited uh, way for me to gauge how people are receiving the poems that I read. And very often, uh, these are poems that I'm reading for the first time out loud ever. I mean, I read it to myself as I'm writing it or trying to find a place for it in the manuscript or see how it sounds to see how what I need to change. But as a finished product in a book that has been published, uh, almost every poem that I'm reading over the last two weeks, this is the first time that I'm reading. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of testing the waters for myself as well, in a sense, to see how uh, what it feels like in the mouth to read it out to people who are listening. You know, it's so interesting because um, I sent a message to Sonia saying, is she, is, did she fall sick? Did Sridhila fall sick at some point? And you mentioned that. And I told my husband, he wanted to listen. And I said, don't listen because, you know, when I talk about my father's death, it disturbs him. He's one of those people who puts his past behind. And I said, no, I need to talk about it today. So I said, just don't come. So he didn't come. So like your mom, these topics disturbs people. But for me, putting it out there makes all the difference, which brings me to your uh, poem about this thing called peace. So ever since I was a little child, I'd say, you know, I want peace. I want peace. And my cousins would say, what's wrong with you? What do you want peace for? So, and I remember in a, another conversation that I had, um, Someone asked me, what's more important, peace or justice? And we talked about it and we realized that it's justice because without justice, there is no peace. As Prince said. Hmm. <clears throat> so as uh, putting all that together, I'm just going to read this thing called peace. I read about war to avoid this thing called peace hovering uneasily over our days. The planes prowl the dark skies, seeking places people can't find on a map. Afterwards, the storytelling. It's simple, it's complicated. As the day moves from longitude to longitude, the world moves from peace to peace, following the drums of war or justice. It's hard to tell which. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Rubini, for uh, engaging with us like that and for talking about uh, you know the the intricacies of Sridhar's poetry and how it resonated with you. I, I suppose if anybody wanted to you know find out the therapeutic uh, effects of poetry, the curative effects, uh, I, I think this would be the place to come to. And uh, you know, while we are talking about these transformations, as, as we have uh, seen in uh, this thing called peace and a number of other poems, actually, that Sridhar has written in this particular book, uh, there's a sense of transformation that is there, you know, a, a series of, let's say, uh, travels through various forms of being, forms of existence, and so on. And to throw a bit of light on that, we have, interestingly, Anupama Raju, poet, friend of Samyukta, who will be reading the reflective indices of words, yet another exercise in uh, transformation. It's what how I, I see it. Anupama? Thanks, Sonia, and uh, lovely listening to you all. And I must, uh, I must say that all these poems come out in their nuances so beautifully when they're read out. I think that's, that's what I've been enjoying. And every voice, every intonation, every pause, every breath uh, has enriched uh, Dala's work. So thank you for, for that. Also, Arugmani, thank you so much for talking about something very painful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so moving on to this particular poem, very instinctively, for some reason, I chose to read out this poem some, some days ago. Uh, I really don't know why, but um, when I think back, I think it's about the shape of words and how the words uh, that we all know can, can actually be quite dissimilar. A particular word that looks uh, you know, that looks like something to me need not look like, uh, look the same way to you. Um, also, there was a certain movement and between each lines, I thought there was a certain space where we could all hide. Uh, and there was also this constant play between speed and um, the speed that is arrested. So I'll read the poem and then I'll also mention one particular element which kind of struck me. It's also a very visual poem. That's, that's something that's struck. The refractive indices of words. The road between clarity and obscurity is paved with the refractive indices of words. My crystal, your mud. My harvest, your husk. My papier, your mache. Not erasure, but bending. The thought like light approaching at speed until the brakes are applied. Now the word light, the way uh, Sridhala has used it, it's actually very visual, it kind of, you know, it kind of arrests you. Um, also the spelling, and those of you who know the poem know that it's, it's been spelled differently, which is why I said it's very visual as well and the shape is different. It reminded me of the painting, the screen. Um, and I, I could kind of instantly feel that I was reminded of this face that you see in Edvard Munch's painting, where you see this uh, absolutely, you know, disturbed face who's kind of screaming for help some sort of thing. So it's like as if there was somebody here who's screaming it out. Uh, so that was one association that I made in my mind. Um, this is the reason I said, I think all of us agree that 
a poem is written in a particular context, but it's read uh, by the reader in another way. And then when it's read aloud, it, you, you, you receive it in yet another way. So yeah, that's what appealed to me. Thank you. You know, when you read it on Twitter um, and posted your reading, uh, I told you that one of the things that, that I hadn't yet figured out was how to read this poem because it is a visual right. poem. I mean, there's, yes. uh, and I hadn't worked out how to read it. And I really appreciated that you wanted to read it and recorded yourself reading it and posted it to share because uh, I could have gone the entire reading life of this book and never read it aloud because just because I didn't know how I wanted to read it, I hadn't figured it out. So I'm really glad that, uh, uh, that you wanted to read it despite the visual, uh, let's say, roadblock or word block uh, of, uh, of this poem. No, thanks. And I don't know if this is how you want the poem uh, to sound like, but uh, I, I did what I could and I hope, I hope it does justice to, to the wonders of your words. Thanks, Dava. You know, this is a thing that I think, um, I mean, so often, um, we're told so often that poems are sound, and they are, you know, and like you, you all have said, it makes a difference when something's read aloud and you listen to it. But also, um, many of us, or at least I, experience poems visually equally. You know, it, it matters to me what it looks like on the page. When, I'm, when I buy a book of poems or I'm browsing through it, I will pick a poem to read first, uh, depending on what I see on the page or how it looks on the page or, you know, or, or a word that catches my eye. So I think the experience of poetry for some of us is a, a, as much visual as it is oral. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Yes, that's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, I was just uh, looking at your uh, poem hypothetical. Yeah, you know, where, uh, again, uh, you know, though the visual element is is not very strongly present, but I, I think that there is uh, uh, an oral element that is there uh, in, in the way that the words, you know, end with that dissonant note. So uh, could we just uh, have you read that, please? Sure. Yeah. Hypothetical. The stinging lip, the ringing ear, the toppled light. This is not hypothetical. If you could kill with your bare hands, you said, bare hands. The one you love and the world became a better place. This is hypothetical. A better world in words only. If you acted, if you did not act if you rose, if you drowned, if you stayed or left, if you were stayed or deft, if you sliced time too thin for pain, if you provided a line and turned it into a rope, if you allowed yourself to hope, if you spidered into a corner, if you drew and quartered, if you cornered truth and flayed it alive, if you were surrounded by light, if your blind spot shone like a torch in the dark, if you loved with your bare hands, if you stung with your lips, if you toppled the light with your blind spot, if you drowned with your wings, if you stopped, if you walked away all your life, hypothetical. It's a beautiful, uh, you know, sense of uh, the hypothetical that comes across, you know, uh, the, the multiple ifs and the many possibilities that they present. And for me, when you couple that with uh, three false starts and the conclusion, it pretty much sums up, uh, you know, uh, most of our lives, <laughs> if you think about it. You know, the, the what ifs and, and uh, this, this whole idea of uh, having excised ambition is not the same as never having had any at all. Uh, may I uh, request you to read that particular Part one of three, 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 three,
uh, if you find it too long, then at least no. Read. I don't mind if you if ah, you're okay, okay for time. I don't mind reading the whole thing. Yeah, we have a bit of time, so okay. Um, so I just want to say a couple of things about these poems, which is that um, you know, uh, compared to this one, uh, Escape Artist is very much more visual in the sense that it draws very much from the visual arts. And uh, if there was any one thing that I had as a project to try and do, it was to kind of excise the dependence on the visual because. Uh, you know, it's very easy to uh, allow an image to stand in for all the things you want to see. Uh, and I wanted to not do that anymore. Uh, so these poems, Hypothetical and Three False Starts and a Conclusion are uh, not, I won't call them experiments in that, uh, in that direction, but they, they are part of my uh, wanting to avoid that part of it. So uh, maybe we could have the one conclusion, the one false start, I'm sorry. Okay. The lost is love. The okay, I'll sentence. read that one. Yeah, I'll yeah. read. So this is a poem in four parts um, uh, and I'm reading the first part. It's, uh, and that itself is a poem in four parts. So uh, three false starts and a conclusion. One, lost is love. One, to have excised ambition is not the same as never having had any at all. I excised it. I never had any at all. I can't tell. My ambition now is to hide effectively, which is to say, I would like to do nothing superlatively well, to be known for it, to be renowned for doing nothing. Oh, am I confusing fame with ambition? That is not my intention. Once I threw myself into the new and abandoned it when it became old. I was, I am a child in these matters. I would like to say I am different now. I am different. Now fear drives me, though I act upon it by doing nothing. Two, not doing is not the same as doing nothing. Three, find purpose, the man said, and the means will follow. If I run for the shadows, if I hide, if that is my purpose, do the means follow like a docile calf its mother? Or does it give chase and futile from the start because what would it look like for means to follow purpose in this matter? Four, I'm paraphrasing two poets when I say I am doing nothing, and that is poetry. Listen. And there comes if I run for the shadows. <laughs> there it is. So, uh, you know, when you say I'm paraphrasing two poets, and uh, then soon after we meet uh, Eunice D'Souza in Testament. Now we've had Arundhati Subramaniam, who's also, uh, you know, written about Eunice D'Souza. For Eunice Susan, it's best to meet in poems and so on. So uh, here, you know, you have uh, mentioned her. So is, is there a direct association or? Uh... <laughs> well, uh, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't remember Arundhati's poem, but if I'm not mistaken, um, a lot of these poems were written when Eunice died. Uh, Peter Griffin, who was uh, at the Hindu in Bombay, in the Bombay Bureau of the Hindu, um, asked uh, a lot of uh, poets who either were Bombay, uh, people who had lived in Bombay and studied with Eunice or uh, who had had something to do with her or knew her or liked her work or whatever, whether they would contribute a poem to a special issue. Um, and he asked me and I wrote this poem and I imagine Arundhati did the same with the poem that is in her recent collection. Um, so, but uh, as I said uh, in the quarantine train reading, uh, Eunice is uh, one of the Indian poets writing in English whose work I first encountered as a collection. She was a poet I first encountered entirely through her collection, Women in Dutch Paintings, uh, Women in Dutch Painting. Uh, so, you, you know, we tend to encounter a lot of poets in anthologies or in things that you're forced to study in school. Uh, Eunice was the, was the exception, and uh, it was the first time in my life that I was reading an entire collection of poetry from beginning to end, and her uh, 
it was very impactful to read her poetry to to find out how much she could say with how uh, little and uh, brevity of course is something that a lot of uh, people strive for in their work i'm not uh, you know i'm not an advocate for brevity for brevity's sake i think a poem should have as many words as it needs to have to say what it needs to say and sometimes it goes over pages and that's fine with me but i think uh, what yunus does that's really uh, important to me in my own poetry is to uh, just say as much as needs to be said you know and for her that was very little and if you read her last collection there are poems that are just a bare two or three lines long because that's she says volumes in that much you know in that much space um and that's a valuable lesson for any poet to learn um, yeah so that that was my tribute to her in the poem I totally agree with what you said about Eunice because I'm a huge fan myself who have never had uh, occasion to meet her. So uh, on that note, uh, we will be, you know, winding this session up. But before we do that, uh, you know, uh, I would like to talk about uh, context having to shut down and how this book has had an extremely short run. It was released in December. And, uh, you know, it's February now. And by the time it is March, I think by the time it's March 15th, uh, certain bookstores will uh, no longer be containing copies of this book. And I think by March 31st, uh, it will not be available online either. So, uh, you know, uh, I think that a book like this should have uh, had an extremely long life. It should be one of those books that you know, people find on a bookshelf, bump into on a rainy day or on a sunny day or any day going by, you know, the sheer variety of days that are available for them in, in these pages. And uh, so uh, it's, it's extremely sad because it's a beautifully, sensitively designed book. And as you mentioned, there is, you know, so much of thought that has gone into the designing, uh, the structuring of, of it aesthetically as well as artistically. Uh, it is it is a masterpiece. So uh, I I really hope that you know more people reach out and get this copy uh, because uh, it, you know you buy one and I would say that you should gift one also because uh, if a, a verse hooks onto the mind of somebody like it did with Rukmini, you know, um, like it did with so many of my friends. I mean, I I have sent a copy of this book uh, to a friend of mine who is. Uh, well, recently, uh, who's lost her father. And I, I felt that uh, somewhere that there would be a, a place where, you know, she would find comfort in this. And for me, basically, your uh, fall starts at the conclusion. The first segment is, is my life. The, the <laughs> eternal, uh, you know, considerations that go about. So um, I, I would say that, you know, uh, this book is everything that poetry is supposed to be. You know, uh, for me, it's a, it's a beautifully complex and intricate ecosystem. But before I, uh, you know, bring about this entire event to a conclusion, I would like to ask the audience if they have anything to contribute. Even if you want to read something, it's fine. Or if you want to say anything, that's also great. Anupama Mani Rukmini Chivakami Rumini. This all the participants are there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, Mani has had considerable uh, comments on the the light poem, where she says, uh, you know, light seems to be a, a running thing in one light <laughs> only. <two. laughs> yeah. Uh, and she says, in one light is approaching the speaker and stops with a break. And in the second, the blind spot topples light. Uh, and hence the running. Thank you, Priya. Uh, wonderful to hear you speak on your poems, marvelous conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. And Anuradha Nalapad seems to feel that your poems are very deep, visual, and vast, and they need a couple of readings. Yes. So, Anuradha, you no, should I just get want a copy. to add one thing to what you said, uh, Sonia, which is that. Uh, gift certainly but consider gifting it to libraries where more than one person will read you know and uh, more than one person will have access to uh, a book and uh, 
it belongs to everyone in a library. So uh, if you are considering giving a copy of this book, if you already have one and you feel like giving someone else a copy, consider giving it to a library. I'll give it to my college library. Mm -hmm. And uh, Anju Makhija tells you on Facebook that she's going to get a copy too. Thank you, Anju. <laughs> Yes, so all, all the comments are coming in now. So if I may conclude, uh, to be very honest, it is impossible to uh, conclude uh, such a session with such a book, because believe me, uh, we have, I suppose, viewed the tip of the iceberg from a distance. Uh, it is what I would like to you know, say at this point, because uh, each page is like the mind. Uh, which brings me back to the image that I had brought about earlier, that this book and, uh, you know, it's, it's poet, they, they remind me of the various textures of the mind. So, uh, you know, it's, it's beautiful, it's very, it's full of gay abandonment, it's, it has love, it has grief, it has a, a certain dry and spry humor, uh, it, it warns you of, uh, you know, a certain mortality. It, it tells you that there are vast expanses of time that, you know, your voice would probably get across to a sentient stranger. There's all of that. And there are shadows that, you know, these images, these trees, these, uh, you know, shrubs and, and lives and people throw, uh, or, or when light is toppled, it leads to these funny formations of shadows. Uh, which offer comfort or which probably could discomfort at the same time. There is light, there is sound, there is taste. I remember about the, uh, my mouth is bored. Yeah, do, do you have access to my mouth is bored? Um, page 17, yeah, one second. I'm just going to read the first couple of sentences. It comes immediately after rituals of departure, which makes me wonder if the placement is entirely random. It's not. <laughs> uh, most, mind, things gosh, in the, most things in the making of the book aren't. I mean, at the point that you start putting it together to print, nothing is random, really. Absolutely. Kashyana see, seems, uh, yeah, thinks, uh, wants, thank you for the beauty. So yes, as I was mentioning, there was light, sound, taste, color, and, uh, you know, look at this, every fried spiced morsel settles upon my liver, dissolves into globules of fat and coats this large organ with dots of yellow. So, you know, that, that, that sense of everything being there. I mean, it's everything that, uh, that poems are expected to be and it is nothing like what you expect poems to be, much like uh, the cover of this book. Uh, <laughs> that you were talking about earlier. So, uh, you know, I, I was just thinking about uh, that, that, that sense of the contrast and I was thinking, it's like a butterfly having muscles. That's how I, I view this book, you know? I mean, you've mentioned uh, butterflies. You've, there is this uh, sense of the sinewy strength as well in, in some of your lines, which you know, I commented upon. And for me, this book is a butterfly that has muscles. It's everything that a butterfly should be, and it's nothing like what a butterfly is imagined to be. And every page, Sridhala, every page is a mind. Yours, mine, the universe's, someone's, but every page is a mind and it shows this deep binding understanding that you have of human beings and, uh, you know, the random and not so random thoughts that run through people almost every day, every second, actually. It's like electricity. I want to thank you for putting this book out there, for you know, putting a considerable segment of your heart and your brain into it, bringing your remarkable skills to fruition. It's, it's truly uh, an inspiration. Thank you so much, Sonia. And thank you to Mani, Rukmini, Anupama, everyone who has attended this reading today and those on Facebook that I can't see. Thank you very much for making time because uh, I don't know what other people feel, but pandemic fatigue with online events is a real thing. So that you have taken time off from the at the end of a working day to listen. Thank you very much.
Yes, and on behalf of Samyukta Poetry, I too would like to thank everybody, uh, particularly uh, Mani, Anupama, Rukmini, who read, who expressed so beautifully, and everyone who participated, who left a lot of their engagements, as you mentioned, and, and are here listening to you, and, and uh, they are here for you. So thank you for uh, honoring Samyukta Poetry with your presence, all of you, and we hope to see you sometime in the near future. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful and safe evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. May the force be with you. <laughs> run for the shadows. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You should run for the shadows. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Take you. Care, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.